Hi guys, it is a gloomy day here in Austin, Texas, here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here on November 30th, 2018, but we're going to head over from Texas to England today where it is my great pleasure and honor to have a conversation with Rupert Reed. We have never talked to a philosopher, and I consider Rupert to be a philosopher. Uh, we'll, we'll ask him about that. Uh, for those of us here in the U.S. who might not be familiar with Rupert, Rupert Reed is an academic and a Green Party politician in England. He is chair of the Greenhouse Think Tank, a former Green Party spokesman for transport, former East of England Party coordinator, and currently a reader in philosophy at the University of East Anglia. He comments regularly through the Eastern Daily Press One World column. I'm not sure that's still going. We'll have to ask him. In his regular appearances in the local and national press, he speaks on sustainable transport, green economics, and social justice. But today, Rupert's going to talk to us about what he sees as pretty much the unavoidable, at least end of this civilization uh, as, as we know it. And you might have seen this video, which I encourage you to read, I mean, to, to view. I'll put the link on here. So after you listen to this, you might definitely want to check out his YouTube video speaking at Cambridge University recently titled, his talk was titled, This Civilization, This Civilization is Finished. So what is to be done? And we are just going to pick up from where that video left off. So, Rupert Reed, come say hello to the folks, and we'll dive right into this. Well, thanks for having me. I'm really glad to be on Flax Chronicles. Okay, so, uh, well, welcome aboard, and I'm sure we can make this a day-long conversation, but let's start right with the the first half, uh, the first half of the title of your speech at Cambridge, this civilization is finished. There's two terms right there. We, before we get into what is to be done, define this civilization and more importantly, define, define finished. What you mean by that, Rupert? Yeah, very good. So by this civilization, I mean the globally hegemonic civilization, which has taken over virtually all of the globe. The only major exceptions to this civilization, as I mean it there, are firstly m most remaining indigenous peoples, of whom, of course, there are quite few, at least numerically speaking. Uh, secondly, some uh, parts of, uh, of uh, peasant uh, culture which hasn't been um, taken over by uh, global hegemony yet, for example, in, in some more remote parts of, uh, of India, there are still very many people living in ways that are actually quite similar to the ways they lived uh, uh, a few hundred uh, years ago. Those are the main um, exceptions to this civilization. So I'm saying that this civilization, the civilization that has been globalized, is finished. Now, what do I mean by it's finished? Well, what I mean is that this civilization is almost certainly going to suffer some kind of partial or total collapse, um, maybe gradual, maybe swift, don't know exactly when it'll be, and nobody does. Um, and if it doesn't collapse, the only way it will have managed to avoid collapse is through having transformed itself. And I really mean transformed itself out of all recognition. We are not going to get through this crisis by just having a lot more renewable energy or by traveling a, a bit less or something like that. The transformation that we're going to need is going to be so total in terms of way of life, in terms of values, in terms of a radical relocalization of society, that in no meaningful sense would it be the same civilization which still existed after that transformation. I think that the transformation could be compared usefully to the kind of transformation that occurred when the agricultural revolution uh, occurred, for example, uh, many millennia uh, ago. So 
I very much hope that that transformation will occur and I'm working towards it. However, I think it would be a very, very brave person who was to bet on that being the outcome. And what it looks like is very, very likely to happen is that we're going to suffer some kind of collapse. But even if we do manage heroically and amazingly to avoid that kind of collapse, my claim is that this civilization is finished because Globalized civilization as we know it will no longer exist if we have succeeded in transforming, radically relocalizing, etc., our way out of the terrible crisis that we have now put ourselves in. Okay, so I, I'm, I, I'm assuming from listening to and reading other stuff you have done that climate change is what you are fingering as the, the, the final... The, the final thing that's going to take that that we're just not going to rise to the challenge uh, either technologically politically and that climate change is going to be what brings us down if we do go down is that safe to say well, yes and no. I think that is fairly safe to say. Uh, that's the importance, by the way, of the current Extinction Rebellion, which uh, I've been involved with, which has started here in Britain and is now spreading around the world, which is rebelling uh, against our likely extinction at the hands of climate change, or at least our massive, massive diminution in the kind of way that Lovelock uh, uh, speaks of, and the diminution or extinction of many, many other um, species, of course, of plants and animals, um, uh, along the way, uh, and that is looking very hard to involve to av to avoid. Sorry, uh, which is why uh, a radical action such as the Extinction Rebellion is now entirely uh, justified. But of course, part of the problem here, as I'm sure listeners are very well aware, is that actually it's it's too much of a simplification to only finger uh, climate change. The biodiversity crisis, the extinction crisis is partly a result of climate change, but a lot of it is independent. A lot of it is a result of massive elimination of uh, habitats and the industrialization of agriculture and so on and so forth, which of course also ties into the land and soil uh, crisis, the fact that we're well past what I call peak soil, uh, and this is a, a, a tragic and, and uh, disastrous fact. We have a, a set of interlocking uh, crises. Mm -hmm. It looks like the most terminal of those uh, is climate, but A, it might not in fact be mainly uh, climate that uh, finishes us off. It might in the end uh, be the uh, the extinction crisis that we're, that we're ramping up. B, you can't kind of really um, separate them out in that way. They're all over, overlapping. They have common causes in the grossly unsustainable ways in which we're living in industrial growth society. Uh, as we know it. But to come back to the, the short way you put it in the question, Sam, yes, I think that the most likely um, um, cause I would finger as the number one cause, if we can separate them out to the extent that we can, is climate. Although even there, of course, we must note that the way that climate is going to wreak its uh, havoc on us um, is quite diverse. Um, it's going to come through uh, sea level rise, perhaps. It's certainly going to come through uh, rising temperatures. It's certainly going to come through a rising tide of climate disasters. And the way that those factors are going to play out is in turn um, quite diverse. So it may well be, for example, that as it gets experienced, uh, the collapse, if that's what happens, um, is a result of, uh, of global famines. But of course, those famines will have been probably largely, if you will, fingered themselves by climate, uh, probably in combination with the, uh, uh, the the soil crisis and maybe in combination with the insect apocalypse as well. I, I'm glad you're mentioning all of these these other interlocking mechanisms going on. It, it's so many. I, I feel like the climate change is penetrating the global consciousness just a tiny bit. I mean, yeah. like when you're on the mainstream media, I would say 80 to 90 percent of, quote, environmental reporting is about climate change. So at least people are, are waking up to that. But whether it's climate change or, or all of these other uh, un, or all of these other unsustainable activities that we are uh, d 
engaging in right now, uh, you just do not see whether it's technological and certainly political that, that, that there's no way we're just going to tweak this system, as you were saying, that, that if we don't rise to the occasion at least to equal the Industrial Revolution, that, that it, option one is, is gone off the table. Yeah, that's right. We have to completely not just step out of our comfort zone, not just step out of the box, but step out, if you will, of, of history as we know it, if we're going to turn this around now. Uh, putting it in terms of the uh, the recent IPCC report, for example, the 1.5 degree report, the best report the IPCC have ever done, but still woefully inadequate, still hopelessly over-optimistic, partly because of the politicized nature of the IPCC uh, pro uh, project, which uh, it points in the opposite direction to the direction supposed by the lunatic uh, climate deniers. Actually, the IPCC is a highly uh, conservative uh, body that reaches a kind of lowest common uh, denominator. The IPCC um, seriously appears to be underestimating the albedo problem, massively underestimating the uh, the methane uh, uh -huh. problem, uh, still far, far too complacent about so-called uh, negative emissions uh, uh, technologies. Uh, and uh, well, you put that kind of thing together with the way that things are going in terms of the rise of people like Trump and Bolsonaro, in terms of the welcome uh, growth of uh, green energy, but it being uh, nowhere near enough, and we're still, you know, subsidising fracking and other complete uh, uh, absurdities. I, mean, I could go on, and your listeners are familiar with uh, yeah. with most uh. of this. There is almost no evidence yet that we're willing to make the changes envisaged in the IPCC recent report, let alone the actually significantly greater changes that are actually needed including the kind of adaptational changes which we'll discuss perhaps in the second half yeah, of, the, we'll, uh, we'll, of the show here today. Okay, but let, let's talk about, a, there, there's basically three options and business as usual is not really an option. Because, yeah. <laughs> so if you get rid of that one, well, let, let's go to the worst case scenario since this channel is called Collapse Chronicles. What do you see as the worst case if a, if we keep on doing what we're doing, and every every indication to me, Rupert, is that we are uh, continuing. We're putting the pedal to the metal, and and this Bolsonaro guy is just, he's he's just. I, I didn't think I could get more depressed after the election of Donald Trump, but the, you know, with, with this guy I, coming on coming on to the global scene now. We're pumping 100 million barrels of oil a day for the first time in history. Uh, greenhouse gas, you know, I could go on and on with this. I see no evidence that there's uh, that we're doing anything uh, on a level uh, to to change business as usual. So, if 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 we don't make any effort. What is your vision of the worst case scenario, which I guess you would label total collapse? Is that correct? Yes, but just before I get to that, let me just say a tiny bit more about what if we do manage to uh, do the absolutely unprecedented. Okay. It seems to be about the only evidence right now that we might be going to do that is the very unexpected rise of Extinction Rebellion and the associated phenomena such as the uh, the school strikes which are starting to spread around the world the climate strikes I think these things are, are very inspiring and I think it's not over till it's over so we cannot rule uh, transformation out and nor should we rule it out we should strive for it but I don't think we should bet everything on it because it's such a, a long shot now Bolsonaro as you imply is probably if anything even worse than Trump which is truly an extraordinary uh, statement to be able to make <laughs> uh, and he's in control of possibly the most climatically important country in the entire world now, uh, Brazil, uh, because uh, obviously most importantly of the, of the Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, so that part of the situation is, is deeply tragic and is going to require something utterly unprecedented to turn it around. So let's, uh, let's go to the other extreme for a moment and assume that we completely fail to turn it around. And of course, what I'm implying, as you've implied, Sam, is that if we carry on 
with anything like a business as usual trajectory, even a reformed business as usual trajectory, then we are probabilifying total collapse. So yes, I think the, the extreme case is total collapse, and I think it's entirely possible. Now, what does total collapse mean? Well, there are various different um, versions of it, various different variants. Um, the most extreme uh, of all uh, is the complete uh, extinguishing of life uh, on Earth. Um, I think that that is, as far as we can tell, um, pretty unlikely, but definitely possible um, in terms of the uh, Venusian scenario that uh, Jim Hansen uh, at one time sketched. Um, it's not entirely clear that his sketch of that scenario works, but it's not, it's certainly, let's put it this way, not clear that you can entirely rule it out. Mm -hmm. It's not clear that if we, for example, um, burnt um, uh, a lot of fossil fuel and unleashed a, a huge amount of the methane dragon, it's not clear that we wouldn't uh, create a runaway effect that we couldn't do anything about, and that could ultimately lead to the oceans boiling off. Um, and then you would get the complete extinction of life, unless you may get the survival of some extremophiles, but that's not a great uh, consolation. Um, one step back from that is that we unleash some kind of runaway effect, but it doesn't go as far as a Venus-type scenario, uh, and it extinguishes most uh, uh, complex life on Earth, but still leaves um, a lot of uh, uh, microbes and some, maybe some insects and so on and so forth. Well, again, that's not really exactly a very encouraging or, or exciting uh, scenario. Um, taking a further um, step back, if we drastically worsen uh, conditions of life on Earth, we could make ourselves extinct, but still quite a lot of other animals and uh, and uh, and birds uh, hang around. Um, or we could reduce ourselves to just a tiny rump in the kind of way that James Lovelock uh, uh, suggests, a few breeding pairs in the Antarctic. Well, that would be quite a lot better in terms of um, the possibility then of some kind of long-term, uh, very long-term uh, recovery from that. You know, there's a big, big difference for any species between uh, absolute decimation and actual um, extinction. I'd like to just kind of throw in here, though, that I do think it's very, very important that we're not too uh, anthropocentric in our attitude um, here. So, for example, if we were to go extinct and... Uh, bonobos and um, whales and dolphins were not to go extinct. Um, that seems to me to be um, um, a much, much less bad outcome than if uh, we all went extinct, because bonobos and cetaceans are very wonderful creatures, and moreover, they might over time evolve to create the kind of highly cultural, highly uh, complex societies that we had, but they might do it better than we appear to be doing uh, right now. Uh, and I've been thinking and writing about this a fair bit in, in the last uh, year or two. I've got enormous admiration now for some of these uh, wonderful social species of, uh, of mammals, which um, seem maybe to be um, uh, doing a much less bad job uh, than we are. And perhaps uh, there are some deep um, reasons for that. Um, then taking one further step back, we could talk about um, what is, I think, now quite a likely um, um, outcome which is a kind of um, uh, total um, uh, collapse, um, which uh, nevertheless um, um, leaves um, humans scattered here and there in little outposts around the world, i.e. maybe not just in the Antarctic. But anyway, look, these are all just variants of, um, of collapse, and they're very, very um, uh, undesirable. What would be much more desirable if we can't have transformation would be the possibility of some kind of new civilization uh, arising from the ashes of our collapsing civilization um, as it uh, uh, collapses and destroys itself or uh, in the aftermath of it. And that's what I now see as the kind of intermediate possibility between, on the one hand, um, transformation, which is wonderful but uh, not to be bet on, and on the other hand, uh, these various different versions of what I'm calling uh, total uh, irrecoverable um, civilizational collapse. The intermediate possibility, which I think we need to pay a lot more attention to, um, is a collapse, but then a new civilization that succeeds the collapse. Oh, okay, so that's where uh, we're we're, we're going to go in just in just a minute. I, I just I just want to hang on the the discussion we're having right now for. For a few more minutes, to, to, I, I I I agree with pretty much everything you said. I I don't give much hope 
uh, Rupert for bonobos, uh, outlasting humans uh, on the planet. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm afraid we're going to take bonobos down before we take ourselves down, and probably the 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 whales too. Maybe if maybe a few dolphins will, 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 with 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 any hope would outlast us, but. But let's get back to anthropomorphizing, if that's the right word. Clearly... Uh, anthropocentrism. Anthropocentrism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, clearly, this... A, a planet of seven and a half billion, and, you know, and then now they're talking, we're heading to ten billion. I want to just ask you about that. Where... Where do you see the the population of this planet uh, by the year 2050? Are we are we going to have seven and a half billion? Are we going to have ten billion? Or are we going to have one billion? Or, or do you have have any way of reading the tea leaves on that? Yeah. So just firstly, just a, a, another quick word on on our animal kin. Uh, look, I agree with you in your. Um, Negative uh, prognostication about what's likely to happen to the uh, to the to the cultural species of uh, of mammals uh, such as uh, whales, dolphins, bonobos. Um, what I'm saying is that if we do take them down with us, that is a truly great crime, uh, a sort of a, a crime of evolutionary yeah. uh, dimensions, uh, a, a, a genuinely uh, a genocidal or rather xenocidal. Um, act and we should really we should be thinking a lot more about how we might possibly be able to avoid uh, committing that act. Now, in terms of where our population uh, is going, it is incredibly hard to say. And people who who say too much about this too definitely are really usually talking way beyond uh, what they actually know or can confidently say. What I think is is likely to happen, although there's something misleading about using the word likely here, because, of course, it depends partly upon what we do. But what I think is likely to happen, or to put it another way, if I were a betting person, uh, which and this talk about it in terms of bets is slightly more satisfactory. If I were a betting person, what I would bet on uh, is on some kind of um, um, pretty major partial collapse between now uh, and 2050. Uh, I think that the, the high population estimates that we sometimes hear are very unlikely to materialize because they are premised on us being able to avoid that kind of collapse. And they just don't take seriously enough um, the climatic situation, uh, the likelihood of, uh, of, uh, of very harsh uh, negative uh, feedbacks, um, and the likelihood of, of huge knock-ons in terms of whether it be famine or epidemic and so on. So I really don't know, and nobody knows, but I would be very, very surprised if the population in 2050 uh, were of humans were higher than it is now. Uh, I think we are, we are talking about the likelihood of uh, some kind of pretty serious partial collapse emerging certainly within the next uh, generation. Okay, so I'm. Uh, hold on, just a minute. I need to. I, I need to work my little my little knobs here. Okay, uh, so we're we're talking to Rupert Reed. In case you're coming into the middle of. In case you're coming into the middle of this. Uh, interview we're discussing with Rupert Reed about the various levels of collapse that we might be looking at on this planet. And we're going to move the conversation now into the third possibility, which is the, the conversation we need to be having on this planet. I mean, it, it, it's the number one most important conversation that, that, that I, I think that humans have had since we climbed down from the trees 200,000 years ago. I think this is the single biggest story on the planet that not many people are paying attention to. So I want to dive into this conversation. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to go to the second half of the this talk that Rupert recently gave at Cambridge University, we've been talking about this civilization is finished. <clears throat> so let's move to the other side of the equation. So Rupert Reed, what is 
to be done if this civilization is finished and, and we don't want to go the way of the, <clears throat> the dodo bird, what is to be done mm -hmm. to, to turn this freight train around? Yeah, so obviously we could be seeing the first signs of uh, some kind of emer gradually emergent uh, collapse event in phenomena such as uh, what's been happening uh, in Yemen, what's happening to the small island states, the rising tide already of climate disasters, the way that in the last few years our climate appears to be spinning out of control, the way that our system is becoming more and more fragile because of the extinction crisis we're engendering, the way that our soil is in desperate, desperate trouble, and the way that we show far, far too little sign of turning any, really turning any of these things around. So if business as usual will lead to some kind probably of total collapse, and if total collapse is a very real possibility and to be avoided at pretty much uh, all costs, and if the transformation that I was talking about earlier, although it's to, devoutly to be wished, cannot be considered tragically to be a probable um, outcome, then as you say, we have to talk more, we have to start thinking more about what lies in between. And my simple characterization of what lies in between is that this civilization being finished is likely tragically to collapse, but could it be that out of its wreckage will come a new civilization or civilizations, by the way, it needn't necessarily be just one. Now, what? let me say something very briefly first, because listeners are probably already surmising something about this, about what that civilization will be like. And part of the answer to that question is that, again, we really know very little uh, about that. Uh, and there are all sorts of possibilities, ranging from it could have a lot in common with the kind of vision of the transformed civilization I sketched earlier. It could be very desirable in many ways, all the way to incredibly uh, undesirable uh, versions, such as various forms of, uh, of warlordism or, or genuine kind of uh, neo-feudalism. Uh, and as I say, it could be different um, in different parts of the world, which, whichever parts of the world manage to hang on um, through uh, what is very likely um, to be coming. So what I mean when I talk about what is to be done is partly thinking about all of this and doing what we can now to start to probabilify better outcomes in the success of civilization rather than worse outcomes. And that means both in terms of what we can do to stop the natural diversity, diversity biodiversity, etc., of the world being decimated to, to mitigate uh, climate impacts, etc. And it also means what we can do right now to try to sow the seeds for a better um, human civilization to follow uh, this one. And when I say sow the seeds, that phrase, I think, can be quite a helpful one to prompt uh, our thinking. We ought to be thinking, for example, literally about seed banks, uh, which we started to find with the worrying events uh, recently at Svalbard, maybe more vulnerable to uh, climate damage than we had thought. But we also need to think of the seeds of this new civilization a little bit more uh, metaphorically. How can we probabilify that whatever comes after our collapsing civilization, uh, if that's what occurs, is um, carries within it the seeds of something good. So I sometimes talk, for example, about the need to start to think about and indeed to construct um, a lifeboat civilization, uh, a civilization that may be able to carry us through the difficult times to come and bring us, if you will, to the uh, shore, although it won't be a very secure shore, um, of something somewhat uh, the other side um, of it. And that means thinking about things like um, community, community values, resilience of, of all kinds. Um, it means trying to be reasonably realistic, having to be realistic about the badness and the difficulty of what's coming, and thinking about how we can hold on to some of what we call uh, humanity um, through um, all of that. So there's a whole range of tasks here, so everything you're... from 
from um, starting out with bits of one's own individual and neighborhood and community kind of prepping and resilience building to more philosophical tasks of trying to kind of picture uh, an imaginary uh, a way of thinking, a way of being that can carry us through uh, the, uh, the difficult times that are coming to thinking about some of the things we need to do or indeed not do um, uh, in order to make things better for those, whoever exactly they are, who come after us. And in relation to that, one thing I'd like to talk about, because it is absolutely crucial, is the very poor relation, but it needs to be a much richer relation of uh, climate mitigation, namely climate adaptation in all its forms. Well, you, you keep saying the words we and us. I need some clarification on what, when you when you say we and us, are you talking a global we or are you talking a much more localized, more, I don't know if the word tribal is is the correct word, but you know what I'm saying. Are, are, are you, when yeah. you say we, are you talking about people in Manhattan working with the people in Uganda, working with the people in uh, Paraguay? You know what I'm saying. And yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that, I see that's going to be tough for that, for that global glue to hold together. And so it sounds like when you're saying we and us, what I am hearing you say is, is much more localized uh, economies, or is, is that correct? I just want some clarification on that. Yeah, thanks. That's a, a, a really good, very important question. The answer, I'm afraid, is somewhat <laughs> complex. Um, so one thing I would say is the we is, in a way, invitational. Um, it's whoever is willing to, to listen and face this and be serious about it, uh, working together. Um, Another thing I would say is that in some ideal sense, the we should be as broad as possible. Um, the invitation one would hope would be accepted by as many people as possible, ideally by everybody. But of course we know that it actually isn't going to be. Um, so on the one hand, some of this thinking needs to be done as widely, uh, as globally, if you will, as possible. On the other hand, we have to face the reality that some of the thinking and certainly a lot of the action uh, will have to be a lot more local. Uh, and as I've already implied, the future is going to be much more local, like it or not. It doesn't matter whether you, whether you think that's welcome or unwelcome. The only question is, is it going to be local by choice or are we going to wait until a sort of enraged uh, nature um, that's been tormented by the things we've done to it uh, wreaks a, a terrible revenge upon us and enforces a radical relocalization upon us? So obviously... The, to, the, to the extent that we're able to do it more voluntarily, that's going to be better. There is a radical relocalization coming. The long supply lines we're used to living with are no longer viable, and that will become increasingly clear in years to come, uh, as there are virtually certainly um, more uh, famines to come in the coming years. Remember, crucial to remember that things are bound to get worse for quite a long time, climatically speaking, because of the huge... Um, time lags in the system and because of some of the feedbacks that we've already started um, to unleash, even if we manage to turn everything around and create an absolutely unprecedented transformation of the kind I sketched earlier, things are bound to get worse for some years to come. So we are going to see worsening climatic conditions, worsening climate disasters. We're going to see more uh, famines of the, the kind that uh, you've, uh, you've got cases of in, in parts of uh, Africa and the Middle East. Um, and um, in terms of trying to, in terms of that context, it is complete insanity for countries to not be um, food sovereign uh, and uh, and in more obviously uh, food secure. My own country, for example, um, uh, Britain or England, produces um, only about sixty percent of the food that it consumes. A, a totally absurd position to be in as we go into the uh, the geopolitical and climatic situation. Uh, that we are now going in. So I think that we we need to be cooperating wherever possible and feasible and preserving our humanity across long distances and across the globe. But we have to accept that there are going to be huge constraints against that. And we have to accept and we have to welcome, we have to welcome the chance to uh, relocalize ourselves uh, a lot more. Now, how local will local be? Uh, are nation states going to be viable in the, the next generation or two? Well, we don't know yet, but I very, very strongly suspect that actually a lot of what we're going to need to do is not going to be at the level 
uh, of the United States, nor even at the level of the United Kingdom. It's going to be at the level of um, regions or um, counties or um, neighborhoods even um, to some significant uh, extent. Uh, and we need to be thinking and acting now towards that kind of radical relocalization in the kind of way, for example, that the Transition Towns movement have, uh, have tried uh, to do. Well, it, it seems like the, the, the whole notion of carrying capacity, which I'm assuming everyone knows what the definition <clears throat> of that is, listening to this interview, that these, these well, certainly on a global scale, but even on these localized areas as these, as these jurisdictions figure themselves out, that the, the various carrying capacities are, are going to have to be established where, where you can't have a situation. As, as you said, that 100% of the people living off 60% of the food, uh, it, it, there's going to be, there's going to be some very painful adjustments. I mean, both on a, from a social perspective and, and which I want to get to in a few minutes, I want to talk a little more about the the social civilizational reaction to all this, and then the just the just the personal uh, ache, heartache, and headache, and everything else yeah. they're going to feel. So talk talk about talk a little bit about that about the let let's talk a few more minutes about the social and civilizational response. Uh, about what that's going to that's going to have to look like in order for anything to be left, and then we'll move over to the more personal uh, how to deal with this. Yeah. Okay. So um, you used the word tribe uh, a few minutes ago, and I think something like uh, that kind of concept, which has some problematic connotations in our society, which is kind of itself interesting, something like that kind of concept is going to need to return. The kind of uh, anonymous um, way in which we live with communities of concern that some of us that we think of ourselves as being in that go across really long distances a lot of that is not going to be likely to be viable in the radically relocalized uh, future um, that is uh, that is coming. Um, that's uh, again, I think, um, pretty much uh, uh, for sure. Um, in terms of the the broader picture of adapting to what's uh, coming, there's some uh, absolutely uh, crucial stuff to consider here. So my colleague Jem Bendel has coined the term deep adaptation, uh, and I'd urge readers who haven't read his piece yet to yeah, uh, to read it, uh, and maybe then me read my little response in uh, in uh, Medium recently, which is called uh, "After the IPCC Report: Climate Reality." Um, I don't agree with Jem about everything, but I think that the basics of what he's saying are very very well taken. And what his concept of deep adaptation is saying is that given the, as I would put it, very high likelihood of some kind of major uh, collapse uh, event. We need to be thinking about how to try to prepare um, our common future for that now in ways that make it a, as least bad as possible. Let me tr concretize that by giving um, a very powerful example. Some people are talking about uh, nuclear power uh, as a way in which we can um, deal with uh, the climate issue to some extent by um, reducing uh, emissions at the point of, uh, of, uh, of burning. Um, now, I think there's all sorts of arguments against uh, nuclear power as well as, as some interesting arguments for it. But the argument I think we haven't considered seriously enough yet is the argument that comes straight to mind as soon as you think of the deep adaptation scenario, which is... Do we really think that it's sensible to bet on civilization being intact over the next several hundred years in such a way that it can take care of um, all the nuclear waste we've, we've accumulated, plus fresh nuclear waste that people are wanting to bring in from new nuclear power stations they're trying to build? At a time of A, likely um, uh, partial or, or possibly more than that, um, societal collapses and B, rising sea levels. Of course, one of the fundamental facts about nuclear power stations, they're virtually all on the coast because they need huge amounts of water for cooling. And if you don't have that water for, for cooling, 
then what happens to uh, spent nuclear fuel and, and some other nuclear waste is that it can quite quickly uh, catch fire and start burning terrible mm -hmm. toxic fires that will burn for decades or possibly even uh, hundreds of years. Now, imagine a scenario in which we are starting to experience collapse events in significant parts of the world and these nuclear power stations start going down in that fashion. I mean, it's too dreadful to contemplate and will affect, will, would affect everyone who survived, including all um, animals and plants and so on as well, obviously. Um, but we have to contemplate it. Right. So what does that mean? Well, what deep adaptation says is to adapt to the future in a seriously deep way to try to ensure ourselves at least a bit uh, against the collapse that may well be coming is absolutely irrational to have new nuclear power. It is absolutely unacceptable to uh, prolong nuclear power. And we must do what we can, which is only a certain amount, but it's quite but we have to do what we can to protect uh, that nuclear waste from those kind of fates. Um, in the future. So that's the deep adaptation. And there are other things that, that many other things that have to be considered under that heading, such as, for example, the high, high likelihood now that a number of coastal cities are going to become uh, unviable and the need to adapt in a deep way by starting to think about moving people away from those coastal um, areas to, uh, to live um, elsewhere. By the way, that's another reason, of course, why it is completely uh, absurd to um, have large populations living in areas where they don't have access to uh, food uh, sources, the, the growing vulnerability of, uh, of, uh, of coastal regions and coastal peoples and the likelihood that we're going to actually lose some vital and rich uh, land. Uh, and if you're thinking about a situation of a country like Britain which cannot feed itself, then you just need to ask yourself this question. What do you think should happen to such a country um, in a time of global famine, which may well be coming. I mean, does Britain have the right in those circumstances to demand that other parts of the world, which will be also suffering very badly, continue to feed it? So it's not just about um, um, self-interest, although obviously it is about collective self-interest. It's also about saying, if you think that Britain has some kind of God-given right to carry on getting food from all parts of the world in the future in order to feed itself, then what you're actually in practice saying is that other people should ne necessarily starve yeah, in order yeah. to get fed, which is an utterly unacceptable proposition as far as I can see. So there's, there's, there are serious moral reasons as well as serious practical reasons for saying countries and indeed regions and localities have to work to become more self-sufficient um, in terms of uh, such absolute essentials uh, as, uh, as food and, uh, and water. Um, so um, back to um, um, adaptation, the other kind of adaptation which I think is crucial to inject far more strongly into the conversation, we, we can't carry on putting all our eggs in the basket of mitigation and prevention given that those are tragically um, en route to failing. The other kind of adaptation we have to talk about and do a lot more is what we in my think tank Greenhouse call transformational adaptation. And what transformational adaptation means, adaptation which is not merely defensive, which is not just building higher dike walls or whatever, um, but which is a transformational of society in the kinds of directions we want and need to be transforming our society anyway, and be simultaneously uh, mitigative as much as possible. To the extent that we engage now in transformational adaptation, things will be less bad for the future, whatever the future um, um, holds. Uh, and we'll, we will have more um, of a chance of having some kind of good outcome, whether that outcome be uh, conceivably a, a genuinely transformed civilization after this one is, is, uh, is finished, or perhaps more likely a kind of um, successor um, civilization. Okay, I, th 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 this conversation is absolutely fascinating, and, and, and unfortunately we're already at 43 minutes, and I really want to... Uh, talk about I, I I'm gonna name you Rupert uh, and hope you won't argue with me with this was so I, I think you're you're definitely one of the new breed of philosophers we don't have an eco I, I mean there's been no philosophers in in human history that have faced what we're facing yeah, uh, I right. mean it sounds like we're yeah. gonna have to br we're gonna have to breed a, a literally a whole new line of like eco collapse philosophy uh, is yeah. what I'm hearing but I want to go from from that and what a, a term I've heard I think you used it in in your own talk at Cambridge about eco psychology 
And let's just get to the more personal, particularly, you know, when you started your speech there at Cambridge, you know, you were talking to this group of young people and you said, I am afraid that some of you, you know, standing right in front of you are, are not going to live to grow old. And it must be terrifying. What, what just happened literally in the last three minutes, Rupert, is where I'm, where I'm having this interview, my friend grabbed her 18-year-old granddaughter and threw her in the car and fled because uh, she doesn't want her 18-year-old granddaughter hearing us having this conversation. Literally, literally in the last five minutes while we have been having this conversation, uh, that, that yeah. is what's happened. What do you say to an 18-year-old? Who does well, want to have you? Know, what do you possibly say to an 18 year old uh, looking yeah. ahead who understands this? And, and just, just take a run with this for a few minutes about the whole yeah. depression and fear and pain and emotional pain and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's very hard. And, uh, and you know, thinking about it right now and hearing what you're just saying, Sam, you know, I'm, I'm just feeling it all again, uh, as many listeners probably have. I have uh, appalling dreams sometimes. I end up weeping about these things sometimes. This is really, really tough. But you know, people like us are, are going through this. Um, and there's a lot more people out there who are sort of trying to fend it off and find it more and more difficult to do so. And this is the thin end of a very, very large wedge. There's going to be an enormous mental health crisis soon. You think we've got bad mental health already in countries like Britain and America? <laughs> Just wait. There is a vast mental health crisis coming, which this is just the leading edge of, as more and more people in the world wake up to, to the absurd and terrible things we have done and to where that is likely to be taking us. So what do we do about that? Well, as you started out by saying in this question, one of the things we must do is be courageous enough to face it philosophically, to really think it all through. Uh, and across the, the board, in fiction, in, in the arts, for example, we need to have more of this. We need to have eco-collapse being systematically thought through and faced in philosophy, in the arts, in politics, and so on. Now, how does this work with regard to the young people? Well, it's very difficult. Um, but I decided in my own teaching at the university, I teach at the University of East Anglia, um, I decided a couple of years ago that I couldn't anymore carry on pretending that everything was probably going to be fine uh, and talking about rosy possible future scenarios and if we change this and if we change that, um, then maybe we're all going to be fine. Because although there are conceivable ways still in which we could transform ourselves in that way, as we started out earlier in our conversation saying, we have to face facts that these ways are getting more and more difficult to take to, to make real by the day, uh, and that we are not showing anything like sufficient sign of moving in those kinds of uh, directions. So we have to think, we have to think eco-collapse, we have to think um, the possibility of a successor civilization and how we could get there. And when we start to face up to this, it means that there is a great deal of emotional work to be done. So one of the things which I do, as you've noticed in my talks, and I do this with my students at the UEA now at my university, is I level with them emotionally and I express my fears for myself, for the world, for them, uh, to them directly. And I find that that makes a, a bond of a kind and that enables us to, enables us to have a place to start. Now, the, it's totally understandable the reaction of the person who's just taken the, your... Uh, the 18 year old um, away because they didn't want them to hear this but I'm afraid that isn't in the long term likely to serve the interests of that 18 year old people need to start facing this now otherwise a they won't do enough to stop the worst outcomes from becoming reality you know we need to be woken up we need to collectively wake up and that involves a lot of despair and a lot of horror and b when the mental health crisis hits, when the despair or whatever hits, it's only going to be even worse. Uh, Joanna Macy talks about despair work or despair and empowerment work. And I think that's very, very important. She's a great teacher um, in this area. You can try to fend off despair. You can try to kind of hold it at bay. But sooner or later, 
it's going to get you if there's a good reason for it. It's better to face it and work with it. And to some extent, then you can work through it and find new um, ways of being. So, for example, that means things like um, uh, concentrating perhaps more on what you can enjoy uh, in the present uh, rather than uh, always kind of uh, planning for a, a better uh, individual future for yourself. It means things like being willing to uh, embrace radical um, political courses. I mentioned the Extinction Rebellion earlier. Once you realize that this society, if it carries on as it is, uh, is completely uh, on the way out, then you're a bit less afraid of getting arrested or what have you, because it, it just doesn't matter so much uh, anymore. You don't have to worry about kind of keeping an unblemished criminal record if the society which worries about criminal records is likely to fall if you don't, along yeah. with others, change the direction of that society sufficiently radically. So, yeah, one of the terms which has been used here, which I think is very powerful, is the concept of eco-psychology. Well, define what the that eco-psychologists term, say, What the eco-psychologists say is you are not separate from other individuals and you are not separate from the earth itself. And if you are feeling um, terror and depression uh, and despair, then maybe that's not just kind of an individual problem that needs to be pathologized or fixed with some drugs or whatever. Maybe that's a kind of symptom that, that makes sense um, of the situation that we find ourselves in, a symptom of, uh, of the way that the earth actually is. Uh, the way that this sometimes gets put is that we are nature coming to consciousness of our position in relation to the planet. And that position is a profoundly problematic one at this point, this fateful moment uh, in human history. So the eco-psychological approach, I think, has a great deal of promise as a way of kind of um, putting us more realistically in our context as a way of giving us a way of thinking a about this, which goes beyond the kind of silos of individual quiet despair. And what I find is that when people start facing this stuff, and they start thinking about it, and they start talking about it, in particular, with other people and sharing their fears, and also sharing what new uh, hopes or ideas uh, they might have, then that is a key way in which things uh, improve. Uh, a problem shared uh, truly can be a problem halved. Uh, and I think that we need to have um, a great deal of emotional uh, intelligence and courage to grapple with what we're now facing. Eco-psychology offers some of the tools towards that and towards dealing with the enormous mental health crisis that is now beginning. So, so what is your, well, and give us your, your three minute advice, uh, well, any, people of any age, but particularly young people, what is your advice just to keep from being overwhelmed with despair, just to the point of uh, of just paralysis? Uh, and yeah. They really think it through. What do you have a a three minute program you would? Yep. Advise. Yep. So I would say um, enjoy life now. Don't always be thinking about your career because you might not have one. So enjoy life now, but don't enjoy it in a kind of stupid, extreme, denialistic, kind of hedonistic way. Enjoy what we actually have uh, right now. Even now, we have, you know, wonderful uh, wild spaces. Uh, we have all sorts of possibilities for education and learning and wisdom and, uh, and uh, mutuality. Um, do a little bit of uh, preparation for the future. Something which can be empowering is to actually start doing some of the things that one can do to prepare for what may be coming. So what would be examples of that? Well, one very good example is learn how to uh, grow food and start growing some food. Get your fingers a little bit uh, dirty. Spend time in wild nature, uh, but also spend time uh, in the garden or in the uh, allotment or in the or in the forest foraging, um, stuff like that. And uh, fight back. Um, uh, denounce and uh, go decisively against and beyond the people who are condemning you to a terrible future. Uh, people like Trump, but not just Trump, you know, the, the vast um, um, array of the political mainstream is all complicit in this. Uh, everyone who's pursuing a, an agenda of, uh, of reckless uh, economic growth, everybody who claims that technology is going to solve all our problems when it so obviously um, isn't. Um, most of, uh, of the political mainstream is completely complicit uh, in this, and you should be outraged uh, at that and fighting back uh, uh, against them. I think that the, the school climate strikes are, are very inspiring and something to, 
build on. And uh, as I've already hinted, I would say you have relatively little to lose. So why not get engaged in, in radical political action? So I, as you mentioned, I'm in the, the Green Party, and I think we have to carry on fighting through electoral routes. But that's not enough. It's clearly not enough now. We also have to act much more directly through nonviolent direct action. That's why the Extinction Rebellion uh, is, uh, is such an exciting uh, development that I think is, uh, is spreading more and more uh, to the United States uh, and around the world. I would say to young people especially, but to everybody, get involved in things like that. Uh, don't leave it for tomorrow or till you retire or something, because there might not be that opportunity. The time is now. The time is now. Well, the time is now over 55 minutes. So, uh, Rupert Reed, I have... This has been one of the best conversations I think I might have ever had on Collapse Chronicles. You are surely someone who has studied this issue deeply and, and are very concerned about it. And we appreciate everything you're doing, but I, we need to wrap this up. And how I wrap up every one of my interviews, I will do now. And that is, well, I want you to stick around after we hang up so you and I can talk for a minute. But to, to close out uh, this, this public interview, if you are not talking to Sam Mitchell from Collapse Chronicles on YouTube and you actually had a mainstream media camera pointed at you and you had a 60-second soundbite to send out Rupert Reed's message to the planet here in the waning days of 2018, what would that 60-second soundbite sound like? Well, thanks, Sam. Thank you for those kind words. What it would sound like is something like this. That this is not just idle talk. This is not a drill. This is real. This is a unique moment in human history. We will be judged by our children and our grandchildren by how we act uh, in this moment. Um, the only scenario on which we won't be is if we hasten a collapse so rapidly that they don't even uh, exist. Um, we need to act far more strongly than we have done so far. What the IPCC and others are telling us is only a glimmering of the, the bitter uh, truth about the reality of climate and the extinction uh, crisis. So start to think now and start to act now in your individual life, in your neighborhood and community, politically, and more, in the kind of ways that will enable you to feel proud or feel some kind of sense of dignity. The likelihood is that we are going to a large extent fail relative to the almost impossible odds now facing us. But if we are going to fail, then we need to at least fail having given it our best shot. And that means our best shot at preventing the bad things that are coming, at mitigating them, and at adapting uh, to them. And if we do the latter well, then maybe at least we may be able to leave the seeds of something better to follow this ridiculously failed civilization. Okay, well, that, that was about 90 seconds, but we'll, we'll, we'll give you the extra 30 seconds for that. You're very kind. For that excellent roundup. Uh, again, Rupert Reed, uh, I really, really appreciate you taking an hour out of your busy schedule. And more importantly, we appreciate the work you are doing. I'm going to put the link to this talk. Do you have a website? Yeah, so it's easy to find me on Twitter, um, Green Rupert Reed, that's R-E-A-D. My website, my main website is www.rupertreed.net. Okay, so Rupert Reed, one more time, we really appreciate it, but we have got to go, folks, and maybe we'll come back in a few months and, and, and check in with Rupert to see how things are going, but right now... This camera's getting ready to turn off, so I am going to say goodbye. Thank you for watching.